Once again, good uh, greetings to all and sundry. Uh, Chancellor North Wales here. Um, bit of an update about what's been going on, about what projects I've been working on, uh, what progress or not there's been on certain things, and what other areas have we been up to. I think the first thing is if if viewers were expecting a wonderful update on the Camov, I'm afraid that's stalled a bit. Um, when I presented the last video, it had been during a week off, and in that time I had been able to make progress. Um, as it was, as anticipated, um, the uh, subsequent weeks were, to say the least, pretty uh, hectic at work. So I was back into the... Uh, working the long hours and uh, starting on some additional uh, coursework for my uni course. Um, what that tends to mean is that when I get home in the evening um, I tend to be pretty brain fried and um, as a result um, what um, becomes a bit more appealing are the simpler painting projects and uh, considering um, that I've always got something in the sash to do currently on this Dopin Wars trip uh, what I have done is expanded my uh, French fleet and uh, made a pretty reasonable start on my um, Russian fleets Russian fleet um, so we'll have a look at the painting projects that I've got on there um, there'll also be a uh, review of the most recent kit I've purchased, yes, yet another one uh, from Hannans in London when I'd gone to pick up my uh, eldest daughter from my mum's down there and um, a little bit of a chat about um, the paints I use and my general approaches to the hobby and also a bit more of a discussion about uh, the wargaming side um, so hopefully um, we'll cover a bit of ground today. Right. Um, let's begin projects. Well, recent work has been, as I said, on expanding my French fleet for dystopian wars. I'll start off here with my second magenta class battleship for the uh, Republic of France um, seeing just I wouldn't call it an exceptional paint job by any stretch of the imagination but it follows my usual um, approach of going for uh, does it look good at three feet and it does it ties in with the rest of the fleet I've utilised um, GW Bretonian decals to give the she ship some heraldry. So the fleur de lis you can see on the front there was from that ship, um, from a, was a, a Games Workshop uh, decal, as was the uh, boar's head design on the side of the ship. Um, if you want to see the flags, uh, my method for doing those is in the uh, painting video uh, for the French fleet and for my uh, FSA fleet. So that's now my second magenta done. Uh, my reason for doing it is, I must admit, in the game it happens to be one of my favourite vessels. Might not be the best of the battleships, but I thoroughly like using it. Um, I like the fact that you can dish out the punishment in all directions. Um, and it's got a good range of weaponry on it uh, torpedoes, heat lance um, primary ordnance, secondary guns a nice mix and I think it's a nice model as well so the other side that I added was some long range firepower which in the case of the French is the Epulard sub now in the normal box you get two models so you have one um, basically you get four bases 
two of two sh two subs on the surface and uh, two subs submerged. They're single piece resin. Again, keeping to my normal um, painting technique of fairly straightforward colours and extensive use of GW washes and dry brushing. So, got four of those gentlemen painted up, and um, also made a start on the Russians now. As can be seen here, this battleship isn't yet complete, but I need, it needs to do some quite a bit of tidying up. I was trying out various ideas on the stripes and that size, I'm not going to show it too close. Um, there'll probably be some pics posted on this. I didn't take in progress vids because, quite frankly, all the techniques used were already covered uh, in the other D, uh, DW painting vids, but uh, I probably will post something up in some format. Um, so, making a start there. Again, quite an interesting ship to do. Quite an enjoyable one. Uh, it doesn't need quite a bit tidying up. So, that along with some cruisers some gunships that I've made the start on and these rather strange Russian frigates as I refer to them as the frisbee frigate um, yeah uh, the irony being and the story behind this is the Russians did actually build um, try out a number of circular battleships uh, what they discovered though is that when the guns fired, the ship spun on the spot. Which must have made for an interesting ride. Nonetheless, um, the designers at Spartan Games thought it was great inspiration, I can't say I blame them. So the Russians have circular frigates. Um, I suppose a key driver with this is... Um, I have... In all that I do, I always... My gaming night on a Thursday is what I class as pretty much sacrosanct. Um, I've had periods when I sacrificed at work and then I ended up regretting it. You need that little bit of breathing space. So Thursday evenings from 6.15 to um, 11 o'clock at night at Deeside Defenders War Games Club at the Sports and Social Club uh, nearby here at Broughton is my sacrosanct night. I take my fleet along, I have normally have a game arranged. Um, beforehand, is get the ships out and uh, hopefully administer uh, some battering across the table. This week, unfortunately, I did somewhat uh, succumb to the Prussians and uh, did get, rather get my backside handed to me by them. But okay, fair enough. Lessons learned. But yeah, destroy Russian frigates before the buggers get anywhere near to you. I mean, not Russian frigates, Prussian frigates, before the blighters don't get anywhere near. And that was easier said than done. And uh, as my gunnery dice rolls were uh, rather lacklustre. Um, nonetheless, still a good game. And uh, still quite an important part of uh, what keeps me going. Um, before we look at other things, I think a bit bit discussion about the paints I use. As you know in the model call out I um, with the painting bits I always try to state which colours which paints I use and I have found that things have very much fallen into two categories um, and I will fully admit that I use two hold on place really does need the dusting. I would say to viewers here, what you see here behind me is just very small 
proportion of the space that I have, um, well, the space I have, the room that I have, in terms of the space I have, that rapidly or steadily seems to fill. And I think it would be an absolute nightmare for dusting. Um, I'm one of these people that I don't really throw away anything, so I still have my textbooks, engineering, metallurgy, t and chemistry t uh, textbooks from my student days. Uh, all the reference aircraft reference books that I accumulated since I was a kid. Um, absolutely masses of m magazines. Um, in terms of being a hoarder, I have every copy of Fly Pass since 1976 when I first started collecting the magazine. At that stage, I would have been seven years old um, and even then had been bitten by the aviation bug. And that is a condition that has never really left me. Uh, to the extent that now as an adult, if I'm not, as I say, fiddling or worrying about measuring the real blooming things, I'm fiddling with the small ones, aircraft that is. Um, anyway, back on to painting. Um, I generally speaking work with two paints, two makes of paint. Um, If I'm applying it by brush, good old Ravel, uh, 888 Hamley Carb Baracus, uh, this seems to be the main make, make of paint he uses, and when you see the result, the wonderful results and the sheer quality of his work, you know, you can't, you can't fault it. I think, personally, I find these are great for brush work, they thin down perfectly well with water or good old uh, Tamiya X20A a product which I'd say is probably the best all round acrylic thinner out there. Um, for a while they stopped doing it in these big 250mls uh, but then they had the sense to uh, uh, bring these back. Uh, one of these will last for quite a long time but probably when I uh, get to Cosford in November, to Cosford Telford Model Show in November I'll pick up another one. For airbrushing um, my first point of call is always uh, the Tamiya the Tamiya paints. They seem to be formulated for airbrushes. They thin down beautifully, and uh, as long as your surface prep is right, uh, that you haven't got grease, oil, dust on your model, I think it tends to work out pretty well. The Revell paints are very thick. I don't deny that. Uh, you have to thin them to quite a high proportion. My compressor on my airbrush goes up to 30 psi, and sometimes I think I, I'm struggling. I get a lot of uh, accumulation. I do struggle personally to airbrush these, but I'm quite sure some people have got it down to pat, and uh, it works out pretty well. Um, I think it's, a lot of this may come down to technique, and maybe I just haven't cracked the technique yet for uh, getting the best out of uh, the Revell paints from my airbrush. Um, the other colours that I use, um, I would say for washes, it's always Games Workshop. They seem to have a great level of utility. Um, they keep on messing about with their colours, you know. Oh, here we are with a new range. Yeah, but I like the old colours. Anyway, Games Workshop washes, a good solid. Um, product uh, that does bring a lot for the shading and that side and GW Metallics again they seem to do a great range of these other paints I do have a few Games Workshop colors but proportionally I find I get less and less of those yeah keep on buying the Metallics and the washes but just a general colour range. If I'm hand brushing figures, be it fantasy or whatever, it tends to be Ravel. Um, the other colours that I might, now recently I took a look at the uh, Privateer Press range principally because this colour is so close to the Russian interior um, that turquoise they have in their cockpits. Um, uh, if you look at my uh, modeling builds. This is uh, the Formula P3 Arcane Blue, and I must admit the um, 
Privateer Press Metallics aren't bad either. I've got a few of their colours. Haven't particularly used them apart from this one and the metallic, and I've got no complaints with them. I don't think I'd be inclined to try and put them through my airbrush. That's not to say that they wouldn't uh, work, but this is very much a specific colour for a specific purpose, and that is uh, Russian uh, aircraft interiors. Oh dear. All right, that covers the painting now, the airbrush. Um, a few years ago, picked up a um, through Expo Tools um, their airbrush set. So airbrush and a compressor for what then was 99 quid. Now it's 106 quid. Still, for an airbrush and compressor set for that money it's proved to be very good value it's a double action airbrush it can be a little bit temperamental but that's often as much as anything down to you have to be pretty fanatical about cleaning it I tend to find that with airbrushing you often I personally often spend as much time cleaning the thing as I do actually airbrushing um, the compressor is perfectly adequate for uh, most purposes as well and uh, you would have seen it probably tucked away in the background of some of my other uh, bits modeling collection so it's nothing exotic not the top of the range but it's a good work uh, workmanlike product it's from expo tools expo if you put that in online take a look at their catalog you'll find the airbrush there and the airbrush deals um, and if you're starting out I would thoroughly recommend it I think the same airbrush and compressor is available through the airbrush company um, so it's not your top of the range tower, badger, that kind of uh, product, but it's it does the job. Um, and I certainly think uh, for the modelers wanting to move away from brushes or start getting into their brushes, you can't go far wrong with it. And now, what, three years on, I have, it's one of those purchases that you think, yeah, that was the right thing. The yeah, very interesting thing was I only discovered out about it is I sometimes look in railway modelling magazines for inspiration about uh, scenery and that side of it and it was only from seeing that advertising in the model railway magazine that anyway um, that covers which airbrush and why I uh, use it the one thing I would say is uh, I don't have extraction in here um, so I do nowadays take a bit more care over making sure I have a dust mask one thing I have discovered though is keep the damn thing on uh, it's all too easy you do the airbrushing you take your dust mask out and the room is still full of the vapors um, as I tend to blast um, thin with X20A uh, blast out my airbrush also with alcohol uh, yeah the vapors are can be a bit of an issue. Uh, I don't have a large opening window, just two upper louvres, so do they, they do get open for that. Um, on the brush side, this here is my jars brush. Again, these have been accumulated over many years. I pretty regularly give the brushes a clean with um, the Masters brush cleaner and preserver again I think you can often only find this product online well worth looking for it does extend the life of your brushes um, it's I will regularly give these a clean and even as brushes completely die you can still find some uses for them so something like this which is I'm looking at the state of it, it looks like one of the brushes that my kids got hold of at some stage uh, this would be used for applying PVA glue when doing bases, that kind of thing. Other brushes, yeah, they're going to wear out eventually, but with that stuff you can keep them going, and I've had brushes here that have run for quite a number of years, and that served me particularly well. Um, I keep one general jar for brushes, and on that side, and what the way you mention in the videos is always, always use a tube pot um, 
approach with the um, for brush cleaning. So I have one jar with quite a concentrated mix of water and washing up liquid and a second rinsing pot and then a third pot with clean water if I'm overdoing using the water to thin down the brushes. So keep those in jars separate on the bench and uh, available there. So if you guys want to ask any more questions about my painting, I'm not saying I'm a master painter and it's rigid imagination. You'll find many more of those guys on the YouTube channels, look at some of a lot of the guys I've subscribed to. Off the top of my head, I'll probably say girl painting is an excellent example. Um, Frankie would be Jawa Balls, another great one on the painting side. There's numerous other guys out there on the YouTube, on the wargaming and the painting side who far exceed me in terms of the skill and the talent. My approach has always been does it for wargaming is when it's on a table, does it look coherent? Uh, does it look moderately neat and tidy and is there a sense of a unified hold to the force? Simply, does it look good at three feet? If it does, you're on the right track. Uh, I've never put a war game figure into a, a competition, or even I would. Um, if I want to get more on the detail side, for me that's the uh, miniatures painting, at the, not miniatures painting, the model making, and that's a side where I feel it's to develop. To me, war game painting is about neat in quantity uh, and I therefore gear up the techniques towards that. Right, um, on now with a uh, quick kit review. Right, my most recent trips to uh, Hannans in London. Okay, yes, it's got red stars on it. Yeah. Um, the Yak 27 uh, Mongol. It's an AMA model kit, which I believe is from either Russia or the Czech Republic. Could well be Russia. Yes. Um, you're not with a kit from somebody like AMA model. You're uh, you're not getting a shake and bake. Um, it's great because it covers some of the rarer subjects. But this is certainly not in the top league of quality, but in terms of subject, yeah. Now that's what to me that's what makes this kit exciting. So what do you have? Um, a fairly neat and straightforward instruction guide. Instruction sheet. In black and white. Um, nine ten steps in the instruction process with a pretty good uh decaling and uh Painting guy, shame it's not in colour. Uh, the screws. And now this one what surprised me. The quality when I opened this up, fairly faint with the panel lines, but they are recessed. The sprue gates are pretty thick, and the plastic is rather soft. Uh, no interior side wall or detail on the cockpit, but. But that can be made up for. There is a passable cockpit tub. Um, there is certainly a, a bit of flash. This is a kit that would require a bit of clean up. Um, the engine pods. Quite a nicely separately bagged clear sprue, and I can't see anything on this. Again, there is flash, uh, probably a good bit of uh, a good use of Johnson's uh, clear will help things along. The um, a nice, reasonable decal set. Uh, again, I've got no idea how well these will go on. Uh, but I can't see anything about the uh, register here that gives me calls for concern. Um, those stripes may well end up being painted on, I don't know yet. Um, likewise with that black, but if it goes on okay, it goes on okay. Uh, with the uh, anti-glare panel, that black being the anti-glare panel uh, in front of the cockpit. Um, the aircraft in question, uh, Yak-27 Mangrove, this was the recon version of the fire bar which was the fighter version and the uh, brewer 
which was the uh, bomber version. Um, it was a jet very much of its era, the 1950s and 1960s, and its wing profile, its design style uh, reflects that. I would say in terms of size, the real aircraft would have been on a par with the um, French uh, Vantour, uh, which itself for for the Ameri for um, gentlemen in America, Vantour I think sits similar in size to a um, probably the F one hundred one Voodoo, that sort of general build nature, twin potted engines, I'm just trying to think what's an American aircraft. Um, similar to that in terms of its size um, profile. All you could say is it's smaller than a Canberra, it's uh, bigger than an F-86 Sabre. That's the sort of area it sits. It's a two-seater aircraft. The uh, fighter version had a um, radio operator sat behind the pilot. The, uh, this recon version has a uh, navigator sat in front of the pilot. Uh, was very much an interceptor rather than a fighter. I don't think an aircraft like this would have been used for dogfighting or mixing it up close and personal. Rather, it had a fairly powerful weight on board. The, the fighter version having the firebar and long range air to air missiles, heavily dependent also on ground control for vectoring in. Again, an aircraft of its era. Um, I suppose during the days of the Cold War you would have seen the F-100s, um, the, I think the Hawker Hunters, that kind of aircraft would have been on the other side of the, on the western side of the Iron Curtain, uh, to this machine. Um, brief review, um, quick mention, and I'm more than happy now to do, um, specific discursive reviews for um, other kits. Um, I think for the time being more than I'll focus on the Russian side of it. So to give you an ex some of you example of some of the other stuff I have in my stash. Uh, So, this is just uh, a small proportion of uh, the kits, and what I'm saying is from this lot, I'll mention some of the other types I've got uh, hidden away. Hidden, I'm not quite sure if that's the right word, more um, stuffed up to the bloody ceiling is might be a more accurate description. Uh, the Mill MI35 Hind E from Zvezda. The SU-22, uh, Sukhoi SU-22 from Italieri. Um, a a Zvezda SU-24, strike aircraft. A um, Hobbycraft Yak-38 Forger. A pair of flagons from PM models, the single seater and the two seater. Um, there's also a Camov 25 um, hormone, which was one of the forerunners to the Helix. Um, I have the MiG 29 that I mentioned in that. Uh, the discussion of primitive modelling. Um, there's the Al Crikey, um, the two-seater version of the uh, MiG-15, 
Um, I have uh, the old FX MiG-21 kit. Um, that's... And I'm quite sure if I dig deep in, uh, if I, if I dig a bit more, I will probably find at least one other Russian aircraft stashed away somewhere in here. Uh, that's before I get to the uh, various Western types. Um, as I said, you see a small proportion. This might be people. This came from the pile you see directly behind there. Um, the view here will show. Yes, yet more kits, including scale armor, as and a nice, interesting little stash of. Uh, Oh yes, there's another hind up there. I knew I had at least something else that was Russian. Uh, various other items acquired. Um, the the kits that you might see stashed up over there. Are uh, mostly empty boxes. I tend to I tend to stow away all my um, uh, unused sprues, weapons, decals, instructions. All that stuff gets retained um, and get put into the uh, boxes of include kits. Right. Um, Thanks for putting up with this. I know I crammed quite a lot in here. Uh, when's the next um, collated video going to be? I'm not entirely sure. With the build rate as it currently stands right now, I need to clear some coursework out of the way. Um, hack on a bit more with the Kamovs. Um, they will probably be the next uh, photo collation vid. Um, in the meantime, yeah, I'm going to be probably painting more stuff with dystopian walls. I can't get away from that. Um, so, I will be doing another update discursive vid. Um, again, if uh, any viewers would like me to cover a certain subject, um, I should explain I've been in aircraft now, as, as I've gathered, for an awfully long time, so I'm more than happy to discuss an aspect of aviation or linking the historical significance of certain models. Discuss discussion like that, more than happy to. So please ask away. Um, I can probably dig out info on it. And uh, thank you for uh, thank you for listening.